feels like a couple of months since I was able to be up here. I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak to you this morning, as I am every opportunity I'm given. If you would, be turning to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 2. Our text will come from this chapter. 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. We see from this passage the great King David is on his deathbed. And as is customary, people who are close to dying have things to say. And in this moment, he is talking to his son Solomon and giving him a list of things to follow. We won't go through the entire list because it is quite lengthy, but we will read the first four verses of this chapter. Again, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself, that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, if thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in the truth will all their, with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man of the, on the throne of Israel. So from our text, we see three things that we'd like to bring out. David charged Solomon to be strong to show or to be, eventually become or exist as a man, and to keep the commandments of the Lord. Just think about how blessed Solomon was to have such a godly father. We know from other passages that David was a man after God's own heart, one whom Solomon himself would think on fondly later on. We see that Solomon had received counsel from David, his father, on how to be a man. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Which is what I would like for us to discuss this morning. Now, it's a sad statement, excuse me, a sad statement, but consider just how many today that cannot make this claim, having the, the great blessing of having a father. There are many today that do not have fathers because of death or even divorce. And there are many without fathers due to their failure in leadership. You see, they could be present. However, they do not provide for the physical needs, the emotional needs, the mental needs, financial needs, and more certainly not spiritual needs for these children. We all need guidance in these areas. We all need support. How many families are in existence, if you want to call them families, do not have that support, that guidance from a scriptural father? Indeed, a great blessing it was for Solomon to truly state the words of Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. We referenced earlier, but we'll now read. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father. And attend to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender, and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. You think that's the ideology that's pushed by and large in families today? Of course not. 
So this morning, let us consider then the deathbed charge of King David to his son Solomon, the phrase, show thyself a man, through the words and wisdom of King Solomon. First, we would like to bring out this idea of showing yourself a man, that is, proving you're a man. Nowadays, that might be considered hostile speech. It uh, might be considered contradictory and even potentially illegal later on. People saying you can't be a man or a woman or vice versa, it's a more fluid in nature. Nowadays, we've got to wonder what birth certificates actually say, whether they're male or female. But now knowing that you can alter your birth certificate, I think we're just going to stick with the blood test. That's not what we're talking about here, though that might be necessary at some point. Show yourself a man. Be a man. We've, we've heard this terminology before, and it's usually in, used in a sense of you're being a wimp. Stop that. Or cut that out or whatever you might be. But this morning, we're going to talk more or less how God's man should be. Show thyself to be God's man. If you would be a man, you'll take heed to your counselors. Now, first off, in order to begin this process, you'll need to cultivate the proper fear and respect for your creator, for Jehovah God. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. This proper fear of God will prolong one's life. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27, and chapter 14, verse 27. Fear of God and obeying his commands is the very meaning of our existence. Thus, this ought to be what we continuously strive for with our very being. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Thus, we must allow the word of God to be our primary counselor in this life. Secondarily to that, we need to listen to our parents. Their instruction, especially when obeyed, is like ornaments or jewelry for us. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says there, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Such advice will be able to guide one through this life in the flesh. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee when thou sleepest, it shall keep thee, and when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. We see from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, that obeying one's parents is the right thing to do. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You see, obeying your parents is morally and inherently right. This command has promise due to the instruction given. Knowing how to live on this earth will ultimately pay off later in one's life. Why would we not want to heed the warnings and instructions of those who love us? And especially knowing that they do in fact have more experience than we do. There was a co-worker of mine that had mentioned at work when his children were at that age of being a little bit more rebellious than normal. He told him, you need to hurry up and leave home while you know everything. Well, ideally, the 
parents do in fact know more than the children and the children will learn from those things learn from their parents continuing on with this step process we need to beware of evil companions we know that evil companions will entice you to do evil proverbs chapter 1 verses 10 through 19 says my son if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us work, lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son... Walk not thou in the way of them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for them for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Does that not sound like our society as a whole? We were having a discussion on the way here about the use of fentanyl and how people are getting more crafty and making that more appealing to children. For what purpose? You're going to go kill some kids because you feel like it. Well, that's how evil people are, uh, act. We're warned to not put our lot in with those types of people. We must realize that following this type of companion will ultimately bring our own destruction. Verses 15 through 19 of the passage we just read, and as well as Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Ultimately, the people we choose to spend more time with will have an effect on us, whether good or bad. But we do know that evil company will eventually corrupt our own good manners. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. If we are to show ourselves a man, secondly, we must take heed to our goals. Take heed to our goals. We must seek out wisdom and understanding. We should seek wisdom as if it were silver. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. We know that wisdom, when properly applied, will protect us from those who are evil. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 10 through 22. Wisdom will provide us blessings as a tree of life. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 24. Thus, acquiring godly wisdom should be a priority in our lives. We must also acknowledge God's role in our life. We must trust him and allow him to direct our paths. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And we, not only with our very being, but even with our possessions, must fear and show him honor. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. We need to allow the Lord to be our confidence. For he will bless us, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 25 through 35. And it's usually unfortunate to deal with while we're being chastised, but we do need to accept his chastisement in our lives. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. You see, while it might not be pleasant to deal with while we're being chastened, it's ultimately for our benefit. The example there is used as a father that delights in his son. You think of how many children today who are not chastened. They're not truly loved by their parents. And guess what? Those children are going to grow up and they're going to have those ideals and they're going to spread them to society and ultimately through their own home whenever it is made. 
perpetuating that type of ideology. As Jesus pointed out, we must seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. While having goals related to work, status, and the like are not inherently wrong, heaven should be our highest goal. Thus, we need to do what is necessary to obtain that goal. Third, we need to take heed of our relationships. One aspect of this is to avoid the harlot. This is the woman who would entice you, yet destroy you in the end. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. This is the adulteress that would destroy your reputation and even your friendships. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 23 through 35. This type of individual is able to even destroy the strongest of men. Proverbs chapter 7, verses 1 through 27. Now here are the final verses of this chapter, verses 24 through 27. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way of hell, going down to the chambers of death. We must then be mindful of the fact that a single act of passion can alter or even destroy our lives. Then, steps of progression, we must love our wife. Properly applying the knowledge in God's word in counsel of those older than, ours, uh, older than ourselves we are able to find a good wife. Proverbs 18, verse 22 says, Whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. You see, there are certain women that are, in fact, wife material. There are also women who are not wife material. No, marriage is not for everyone. But that must be realized before the marriage contract is obtained. Either way, as a man following God's pattern for marriage, finding a woman that is indeed wife material and marrying her obtains you God's favor. Now I would point out that as godly parents, we need to mold our daughters into wife material. We also need to mold our sons into being husband material. And then we need to teach both to seek out these qualities in the future spouse. We are told that we must rejoice for having the wife of our youth. Proverbs chapter 5 verses 15 through 19. You see, a wife is to be a life partner. She is ultimately there to help you out and you to help her. Seeking the highest goal that we should have, and that is obtaining heaven when this life in the flesh is over. You're a team. Part of being a man is accepting that team help and pushing that team forward so you and her will be able to obtain heaven. And ultimately being able to take as many souls on this earth with you when this life is over. Now we are also warned from seeking this type of fulfillment from a strange or unauthorized woman. Proverbs chapter 5 verses 20 through 23. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all things. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. 
seeking out these types of relationships lead to many other different sins. Most of the time, people are at least ashamed enough of this type of relationship that they'll at least lie about it. Then you think of all the different diseases that are possibly transmitted through this type of relationship. Simply by not following God's command to rejoice with the wife of your youth. Now instead of this evil path, we should joyfully live with our wife. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 9. In Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 through 25, Paul lays out God's pattern for marriage. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now that's a tall order. But it's something that God expects from every husband in existence. Not just the Christian homes. Everyone will be held accountable for whether or not they discharge their obligations as a spouse. But this here is depicted as a godly home. This is how God would have the home to be run. You see, God loves marriage. And he has ordained it for the very good of man. And he will bring into judgment any and all who would choose to defile it. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Fourth, if we are indeed to show ourselves a man, we must take heed to our character. Take heed to your character. One point to consider is that we must avoid debt and sloth. While not all debt is inherently bad, it does contain or have the ability to enslave. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 18. Now, I think this is particularly interesting and useful with our current climate of all the student loans that's being, quote, removed or paid off. I took out loans from my school. I don't owe near as many as most others. But why does any of you bear the burden for paying for my loans? You don't. Just as Ezekiel says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, I am responsible for my own actions. I am responsible for my student loans. That is my debt. After all, you'll see my name signed on that promissory note. However, there are many who are trying to escape paying these debts off. It's nothing more than legalized highway robbery. You've got folks that already paid theirs off, and now they're paying mine off. And folks that might not even have the opportunity to get debt, now they're paying mine off. Now add about a me and other kids to that mix. Laziness, another point of concern, laziness eventually brings about poverty. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, chapter 10, verse 4, and chapter 13, verse 4. When you choose to do nothing with your life, ultimately you will have nothing, barely your life. Thus, we should always seek to be industrious and to avoid indebtedness. Romans chapter 12, verse 11, and 13, verse 8. Then we must realize and, and know what actually is an abomination to God. We find in, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, a short list of some things that God hates. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, 
feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Again, how much of this, these traits, these abominations can be very easily applied to not only our society and culture in this country, but also members of the church, unfortunately. It says God hates these things. Why would we ever want to partake in them? We must note that our very worship can also become an abomination to God. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8. Chapter 8, or excuse me, 28, verse 9. Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. And Mark chapter 7, verse 7. Thus, we must learn what actually pleases the Father. So that it ultimately may never be said or told to us the words of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me that in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It seems important that we should know the things that please God and even those things that he finds abominable. And then we must work to make a good name for ourselves. A good name. Solomon says that a good name is precious. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now you think about how often that we rejoice in the birth of babies, at least right-thinking individuals. That is a joyous occasion. But you think of more how many people show up to funerals or how many people don't show up to funerals. How many people that an individual that has just died has affected, good or bad? I forget the exact number, but Supposedly, the individual indirectly or directly affects over a million people in their lives. What kind of a name are we leaving behind? We must know that while we are expected to be different from the world, we must also be in good standing before them. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 1 through 16, gives us a very plain and very good outline on how to obtain and maintain a good, a good name. We're not going to read these verses, but I would like to summarize the concepts found therein. In verse 2, we see that those would have a good name is not a respecter of persons. Verse 3 says that this type of individual is wise to make spiritual discernments and steer clear of evil. Verse 4, this type of person is humble and has a holy respect for God. Verse 5, he is mindful of his spiritual condition and seeks to follow the straight and narrow. Verse 6, he is irresponsible as a parent and seeks to set his children on the right course of life. Verse 7, he is responsible for financial matters. Verse 8, he is desirous of doing the Lord's will and sowing seeds that will produce spiritual fruit. Verse 9, he is productive in material things and liberally shares with those in need. Verse 10, this man is unwilling to be contentious or to allow the contentious to be disruptive to the right way of thinking and living. Verse 11. He is pure-hearted and therefore trustworthy. Verse 12. He is a man of principle and standing by what is right and true. 
Verse 13, he is industrious and hardworking. Verse 14, he is moral in all areas of his life. Verse 15, he is willing to use corrective discipline as well as instructional discipline in rearing his children. And verse 16, he is not self-serving in his dealing with others. I would point out that we're all building castles in this life. Those castles that we're building, are they made of sand or are they made of stone? What kind of name are we leaving behind? After all, when we die, that's really all we're leaving behind. Now, it might be nice to receive a trust fund from Daddy Dearest. I have to admit, that, that does sound very appealing. But having a good name is worth so much more than that. And I think oftentimes we just overlook that concept. Having a tarnished reputation is even more difficult to repair. So it's best to get it right the first time. Now as we conclude this lesson, we must point out that there are many other points to consider on this subject. However, the ones we've discussed will suffice for our study. In order to show oneself to be a man, we have discussed the need to heed one's counselors. These are the people that we ultimately listen to, our mentors, people that might fill a gap in our lives. As one who doesn't have a very good father, it's nice to see older gentlemen who are rearing their children correctly who are living godly lives, people that I can look up to. Physically speaking, there's not many people I can look up to. But I do have the, the great blessing of, of looking to these older men than me and seeing their, their greatness. Likewise, seeing their failings. While that's not wrong in and of itself, it's good to learn from our mistakes. Secondly, we saw that we need to consider our own goals. These are the different things that we wish to pursue in our life in the flesh. We need to heed our relationships. This deals with the type of people we choose to love, choose to spend our time with. We also consider that we do, in fact, need to heed our own character. This is the type of man that we will become. Now, if we do have those earthly fathers that offer this guidance in becoming men, we should thank God very frequently for such a wonderful blessing. And we should take full benefit from their counsel and the instruction that they offer. Unfortunately, you look out in the world, there are many who do not have this great blessing. They don't have this type of man in their life, these fathers. However, they do need to keep in mind that there is their heavenly father. He is the father to the fatherless. Psalm, Psalm 68 verse 5. He even puts the solitary in families. Which we'll reference in very shortly. He provides much guidance and counsel if you would accept it. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Now taking his counsel ultimately will lead to one's spiritual salvation. His counsel points out that you must hear his word. You must heed his word, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. You must believe in that word and the fact, the fact that Christ is his son, John chapter 8, verse 24. Repenting of your past sins, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Confessing Christ before others, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And then finally, baptism for the remission of sins, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. As a result, you will become a Christian. You will be added to the body of the saved, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And as a result, as we referenced earlier, Psalm 68, verse 6, you'll be a part of of the greatest family in existence and that is God's family now these are not just guidelines that are here in place if we'd like to follow them 
No, these are the things that God expects from us. And if we do not discharge our obligations, we will be held accountable. Though there are many fathers who may be upright in certain areas, God's man will be upright in them all. That's not to say there's never room for improvement, but God's man will seek out the opportunities to improve and actually take those opportunities. However, becoming a Christian is the first step in doing this. If you've not become a Christian, why not do so this morning in the next few moments that we have? Now, for those who have erred from the faith, why not repent, confess? You'll be restored. You'll be, that error will be removed from your life, and you can go on living as a Christian, correctly, that is. Why not be restored this morning? If you have either of these needs, please make it known now as together we stand and sing.